Well, folks, now there's a lot worse places you could be tonight. Amen. You could be down there in the eye headed for that hurricane. Matthew, as it roars up the eastern seaboard. Turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 6. Genesis 6 and um, verse number 5. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It repented the Lord he'd made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Father, I pray that you bless his holy word tonight as it goes forth. I'm nothing but a messenger, Lord. That's all I have ever been, all I ever hope to be. In thy name we pray, amen. If you remember last week, I showed you some photographs that I took of the ark up there in Williamstown for, in uh, Kentucky. And... Uh, Obviously, you can tell by the way I talk, I was greatly impressed with the ark. One of the things that impressed me about the ark was the magnitude, the size of that, uh, of that uh, structure. And it's about the same size as the one recorded in the Bible. We're not exactly sure. Here's the problem. The standard measurement for a cubit is about 18 inches. But a cubit, depending on whose arm, and you have also a measurement which is called a cubit and a span. So we're not sure exactly how big the ark was. We know that one up there in Kentucky is 500 over 500 feet long. It's the largest uh, wooden frame structure in the world. And uh, once you see it, you'll understand why. Once you go inside of that thing, it's an amazing as how big it is. But a tour through the inside of the ark they'll take you back in history and show you the culture of the world before the flood. They'll show you the altars that were raised in the worship of the serpent god. A lot said about the serpent before the flood. If you'll remember in the book of Genesis, it says, and the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. The word translated serpent in Genesis is nakash. I've told you all that a thousand times. That word does not necessarily mean a creature crawling on the ground like you recognize a serpent today. The curse on the serpent was to crawl on the ground. When God cursed it, that's when he put it on the ground, crawling and eating dust. Even in the millennium, the serpent will be eating the dust when everything else is enjoying the fruits of uh, the, the, the millennial reign of Christ. There's a lot going on with the serpent uh, to this very day, the serpent is still worshipped in many parts of the world. You go to a doctor and you'll find he has what's called a caduceus or a scapulus, whatever you want to call it, and it'll be a double twined serpent around a staff. The serpent, therefore, it represents healing, the healing arts. I've been to Pergamum, and Pergamum is the seat of the serpent worship 2,000 years ago. It's also mentioned in the book of Revelation as being the place where Satan's seat is located. There was a high Babylonian priesthood located in Pergamon. There was a huge library in Pergamon. Therefore, it became a seat of teaching and learning and dissemination of occult knowledge and literature. Therefore, serpent worship is connected with the occult world and no doubt with much in what's called higher education today. No question about it. Therefore, the battle rages to this very moment between Christ, the true Christ, and the devil, that old serpent, or that old dragon that we find recorded in the Bible. So up until the time of Noah, you had two distinct lines of knowledge and understanding in God. One of them was the revelation given in the garden. That revelation was God himself, and that by blood sacrifice and the coats of a lamb, that's the only way that they could be covered in their nakedness. But when these people migrated out and the sons of Cain migrated out, they began to build cities and they began to build musical instruments 
and they begin to make iron instruments. They were, the Bible says, artificers in all of these things. They had a great ability to create and make things. So you have two distinct lines of people in the book of Genesis before the flood. You've got the sons of Cain, and you've got the sons of Seth. Noah was a son of Seth. He was in the direct genealogy of Seth. He's the tenth in line. The number ten in the Bible shows up over and over again as a Gentile number. When you see the number ten, just put Gentile in your mind because that's what you're dealing with, Gentiles. The number 40, the number of trials, the number three, the number of the Trinity, uh, divine uh, perfection, and number seven is divine completeness. So these numbers mean something in the Bible. There are many more than that, but they're, they're very important. So the Bible says the seventh from Adam, which was Enoch, began to preach, and he prophesied, and he said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to exercise judgment upon this earth of its ungodliness and all of that. Now, the Enoch is supposed to have written a book called the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Enoch is appealed to time and time and time again as an authority for what happened before the flood, talking about the angels that kept not their first estate, came into the daughters of men, giants were born to them. I think, folks, we need to understand that the world before the flood was in a mess. And it was not only the man, it was not only the issue of man sinning, but it had to, it had to do also with the development of Satan's kingdom and the power of Satan on this earth as it was being manifested. Things were happening. The Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians says that a woman should cover her head and her hair is given to her for a covering. And the reason he says that that is so is because of the angels. Now, when you begin to think about that, why would, why would it? Now, think about this for a moment. Why would an angel be interested in a woman? Why would he be interested in a woman covering her head? In other words, why would the apostle say you cover your head for a woman? Why would angels be observing women? Think about that. There's something going on in the spirit world. There's something going on. It's been said time and time again that the angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. That's true. But all, neither are we in the resurrection. The Bible says we are as the angels. But that does not mean that a procreation cannot take place. Because the Lord Jesus Christ was born of a spirit that came upon a human being. And that was a miraculous birth. It was a virgin birth. And the Christ was incarnate, God incarnate in flesh. So what's going on in Genesis, folks? What's happening here? Could this be the corruption of the whole human race? Could it be that we have a foreign entity that has moved in foreign in the sense of Satan? I'm not talking about little green men. But it could be that we have an entity that's moving in, that's beginning to corrupt the whole human race. Could it be that Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15 where he said, I'll put enmity between the woman, between thy seed and her seed. The woman doesn't have seed. But that's a promise and that's a prophecy in Genesis 3.15. When Satan finds out something from God, he sets about to pervert it, destroy it, or copy it. If he can't destroy it, he'll imitate it. He'll duplicate it. He'll copy it. And, of course, he can't destroy Christ, so he creates a false Christ. So in the book of Genesis, we've got this seed of the woman, which, of course, is the, is the Holy Spirit impregnating a woman. It's a miraculous birth, a divine birth, a virgin birth, the only birth of its kind. But then by looking at that, we, th we have to say to ourselves, then there's something here with the human race. There's got to be something going on with the human race. And that... That broadens the issue. That makes it, more, it makes it more understandable why God would come and destroy them all except for eight souls. The number eight is the number of new beginnings. So when Noah entered the ark and took his family with him, he, we, he was passing over from the old world into the new world, and he was carried over the flood and the waters of judgment in an ark. That ark, of course, is a type of Christ. And he was carried through, from, from, from the old world to the new world. But that old world was corrupted to the bone. And I mean it was corrupted in a sense, not that they were simply sinners. We've got sinners today. Why hadn't God destroyed the world again? You see, the world's full of sinners. He that, the Bible says if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourselves. You're a liar. The truth's not in you. You know, you're, you're kidding yourself. But it's not about just sin per se. The Bible said Noah was perfect in his generations. The word perfect here is tamin. It's a Hebrew word that means he was pure in his bloodline, that he could trace it all the way back to Seth, that it was, not, it was not corrupted by spirit beings that were trying to corrupt the, 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 the human race 
and destroy the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. If the whole human race had been corrupted, if it had been corrupted, then the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 would have failed if one prophecy, one jot, or one tittle in the Bible ever fails, throw it away. Because it's no longer the Word of God. It cannot fail. It cannot. But God gives the devil the opportunity to do it. That's why he battles him on his own turf, on his own ground. The Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified in weakness, not in strength, in weakness. And he said, who would contend with me? Let him step forth. In other words, here I am. The bulls of Bashan, the demonic powers of this world, all the spirit world that he was fully conscious of, that man is numb to, but Christ was conscious of it. He said, here I am, boys, and they couldn't do a thing to him. And the reason they couldn't was because he was completely and totally, absolutely the only one that ever lived, absolutely yielded to God, empowered by the Holy Ghost, obedient to the will of the Father. So when God said, Noah, build an ark, he's talking about building an ark to save everything that had the breath of life in its nostrils, mankind, humans. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These three sons would replenish the earth, just like God said to Adam, multiply, replenish the earth, replenish the earth. And so all of mankind came from Shem, Hammer, Japheth, all of them the sons of Noah. Noah's name means rest. Now, the prophesied that he will give us rest from our toil, Lamech, his father. He'll give us rest from our toil. What he was talking about was the fact that the earth had been cursed. The earth was cursed. He said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. You're going you're to work the ground, but it's still not going to produce what it had done back before the curse. So cursed is the ground for thy sake. You cannot bless what God has cursed. And so therefore the, the ground had been cursed, and they were sweating and they were toiling in it. And finally a boy was born. And the man prophesied at his birth. It must be that God gave him a revelation. And as I've told you before, the Hebrew, when he names something, he always names it according to some event that took place at birth, like Perez, breach when he reached up, or it could be a prophecy that's associated with it that has to do with uh, Jacob, for example, who was, took hold of his brother's heel, the supplanter, and uh, various things. But... Uh, but, 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 but here we have, we have, we have, we have the, in the Old Testament book of Genesis, we have these people being born and God prophesying and God revealing himself to them through the sons of Seth. Now you've got to remember that no scripture was written. Not a word of God had been written. The book of Enoch, which, which some say is holy scripture, I'll say again to you tonight as I've said before, I do not accept it as holy scripture. It may be valuable to study and compare with the Bible. There may be a lot of truth in the book of Enoch, but I do, not, I do not lay it down next to the Bible and say it is of equal authority as the Scripture. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. There are 66 books of inspired Scripture. And that's it. Uh, but, down, but in the past, certain uh, Christian uh, groups have accepted the book of Enoch as Holy Scripture. They say that the book of Jude quotes from the book of Enoch when it talks about, the, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. The only problem with that is that why is, it, why is it not possible that the book of Jude and Enoch are both quoting from a common source? You see what I mean? What makes you think he's quoting from Enoch? Though Enoch has the same wording that Jude has, it doesn't mean that Jude quotes Enoch. Why is it always that the Bible is attacked? Why is it always that the Bible, you know, that they disparage the Scripture and raise up anything else, uh, you know, to raise it up above the Scripture? Nobody was around when this was written. Nobody can tell you the, uh, the original source of that. But if it's quoted in the book of Jude, I'll tell you the source, God. <laughs> Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But anyway, the book of Enoch gets into a lot of detail about these angels that came down the daughters of men, about the mixture of the spirits into, the, into human flesh and that brought on the flood of Noah. Well, now, the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Noah becomes a type, therefore, of the generation that precedes the second advent. Noah becomes a type of the believers on this earth who are ready for the coming of the Lord, who look for his appearing, and then when he appears, 
He's going to carry them over the floods of judgment. Now the floods of judgment next time won't be water. He'll not do it again. They have taken a beautiful symbol. The rainbow is a beautiful symbol. The rainbow is beautiful. And you can see rainbows as they appear all the time. All the time the rainbow appears in the clouds. And it never appeared before. The rainbow was God's mark of a covenant between God and man that he would never destroy the earth again by water. But perverts have taken the rainbow and embraced it as their own. I'm not going to let them do it. Amen. Amen. The rainbow was here long before they ever thought of embracing that and using it. They don't own it. Amen. The perverts do not own the rainbow. <laughs> just get that out of them. You know how it is. You just got to say it sometime. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's a sign of a covenant. But they, this generation represents the generation that's going to be here when the Lord comes back. And I believe we live in that generation. I may not see it in my little short lifetime, but it's not going to be long. I believe we live in that generation. There are too many things happening too quickly for, for, for it to be otherwise. We live in that generation. Noah preached 120 years, built that ark, worked on it, and they mocked him and they made fun of him. He preached about something that nobody had ever seen before, rain. They had no idea. They had no idea it was going to rain. What's rain? What are you talking about, rain? 40 to, it, God said, build this ark, Noah, because I am going to bring a flood on the earth. And he did. Mount Everest is over 29,000 feet high. It's the highest point on earth, 29,000 something feet. I don't know if you know this or not, folks, but all you got to do is Google Mount Everest and you'll be amazed at how many bodies are lying in crevices all over that mountain and 99% of them are young people. Old people like me don't climb mountains like that. <laughs> 20s and 30s and, and 40s, young people dead trying to conquer Mount Everest that Edmund Hillary did back, I think, in the 50s or whenever it was, that Englishman. They're dying up there, and they're dying trying to conquer the highest. That's why they go to it. It's the highest. There are others that are close, but not 29. I don't know, remember exactly what it is, 29,000 and something feet. But it didn't take long. When you read the Bible, it did not take long. It's just a matter of days, not the end of 40 days, but just a matter of days that mountain was covered. I'll tell you why. Not only did it rain, but the Bible says the fountains of the deep were broken up. Now, when you go in the beginning of the study of the Bible, you'll find out that there is an enormous amount of water up there. You'll find out that the earth before the flood was covered with a canopy, that the earth literally was a kind of a greenhouse, <coughs> completely and totally different that it is now. And people lived back then <clears throat> during this period of time in a different world that we know now. So these waters were broken up, up there, and they were brought down here, and the waters came up. And I've read an article not too long ago that said that more than likely, by the time the water had settled itself on the earth, that the earth weighed at least 50 times more than it did before. Enormous. Water's heavy. How many's ever carried a gallon of water? You know what I'm talking about. Water's heavy. It's dense. And all of this water all of a sudden comes down on the earth. And when it comes down on the earth, I believe it changed the axis of the earth. The, instead of the earth, the earth was tilted. And because the earth is tilted, you get the seasons. You get the four seasons of the year. And it affects a lot of other things. And this is why that right after the flood, the Lord said to them, he said, seed time and harvest shall not cease. My covenant that I make with you, it's called the Noahide covenant, the Noahic covenant, the covenant with Noah. He said it's not going to cease. And so from that day on, they begin to plant and their lives were governed by the seasons. By the seasons, therefore, meant by the years, by the months of the years, by the 12 months that delineate a year. And it wasn't too long after that when they brought them up out of Egypt that God gave them, the, told them when to start counting the months. He said this is the first month, Abib. This is when you count the months. This is when you start counting. And that's March, April. It's springtime. That's when God figures life starts, springtime, because life is popping up. Life is coming forth, you see. But the secular year now, as you'll notice, Rosh Hashanah, you've been seeing it on television, haven't you? They're celebrating their new year. But that's the secular new year. That is a political new year. That's a governmental new year, which means nothing to God. 
The year starts, still starts, March, April. And it's what's associated with that is the Passover. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and died on the cross, he was dying at the new year. Life was springing forth from the one who was buried. And three days later, hallelujah, he rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, we rise from the dead. Because every one of us has been saved, have been, have been raised from the dead. So these seasons become marks in the skies. They begin times of counting. They begin times of measuring. They, there's something that God can use then to lay out the year for them. The first month to the seventh month, he, he covers everything he's going to do with Israel. At the end of seven months, all of the feast days are finished. Seven months. Remember, seven is the number of divine completion. Finished. Don't you think it's odd that the, that the, that the, uh, that the, that the twelfth month of the year in the English calendar is December. Do you know what that means in Latin? Ten, not twelve. Deca. December. Ten. It's the tenth month. So how do we get all messed up? And then January is named after Janus. Janus is the, is the old pagan Babylonian gatekeeper. He's the one who opened the gate, opened the door, and initiated the new. So January is named after Janus. Have you noticed how? We poor pagans, <laughs> have you noticed how we're stuck with pagan names, pagan names of the, of the months, pagan names of the days of the week, all the paganism that we've got? But aren't you glad you got a Bible that says on the first day of the week? Now, what, what do you call that? Now, what's Sunday named after? The sun god. God didn't call it Sunday. He just said the first day of the week. He arose from the dead. And he called the last day of the week Shabbat, the Sabbath, the rest. And that's exactly what happened with Noah. They rested. That's what his name means, rest. And that's what the book of Hebrews is about. It's about taking them in chapters 3 and chapter 4 of Hebrews, taking them back through all of the works, all of the trials, all of the tribulations of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish covenant, the Mosaic covenant, all of that. And he said, look. They never could rest. There was no rest. There never was any rest. But now we can rest because of what Christ has done for us. And that, dear friend, is the difference between salvation and religion. Salvation says, I know I'm a sorry low-down dog and I deserve to go to hell, but God saved me. And he put a new man in me. Now there's two of me. And now i got a battle going on I never had before. But I know who my Savior is. And I know this. I know that it's all based on what he did at the cross. He accomplished it. I can rest in him. And that is the difference. Because religion never rests. Whether it be the commandments whether it be the protocols, whether it be, whether it be the church polity, whether it be whether, whether, whatever, whatever you may be, whatever, whatever you be a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever, there is no rest in their religion because nothing is finished. It's never finished. But when the Christian stands up and says, hold on, he said, it is finished. Amen. Now who? would I be tonight to try to say, oh, I believe that's all wonderful. Hallelujah, praise God. But that disjunctive conjunction, you ever watch how they use that? Oh, I love this but. And they that but comes in there because, oh, that's all wonderful. But there's just a little bit more. No, there isn't. And let me tell you what it's based on. It's based on your own self-righteousness and arrogance to think you can do anything to add to what Christ did on the cross. You can't do it. So tonight, if you want to rest in your forgiveness, you rest in the fact that your forgiveness is based on the blood covenant. If you want to rest tonight and rest on, in your salvation, your salvation is based on the blood covenant. If you want to rest tonight in your fellowship and communion with the Father and with the Son, it's based on the blood covenant. Ha! If you want to rest tonight in what it takes to live a Christian life and what it is to be a Christian and to have joy and peace and fellowship, it's all based on the blood covenant. 
In other words, it's based on what he did, not what you can do. You say, well, now that means I've got a license to sin. Go ahead. <laughs> see how long you go. You ever see a dog tied up to a rope? You got dumb dogs and smart dogs. Smart dog, he'll take off like this, and that rope will grab him around the neck and jerk him back. He gets up, shakes it off, last time. Dumb dog, he takes off like that, rope grabs him, knocks him back down again. He gets back up, takes off again. Are you a dumb dog or a smart dog? Because if you belong to him, go right ahead. Have at it. Those I love, I chasten and scourge every son that I receive. You will not get away with it. <laughs> And if you are getting away with it, you don't belong to him. Now, they can't answer that. I've, I've talked to these guys that believe you can lose your salvation until I'm blue in the face. They just don't get it. Oh, yes, I believe I'm saved. Hallelujah. But I just, I've got to live right. Well, how do you live right? The Bible says it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. And Christ is formed in me. I can't live right, but he can. If I have the right communion, fellowship, and walk with God, there's something greater inside me. There's a life that's greater in me than there is in the old man, and I want to live right. But it's not coming from me wanting to do something. It's coming from who's in me. I belong to him, and he chastens me. Now, I don't know about you, but he's, he, he's had to take me to the woodshed more than once. I'll tell you the truth tonight. I've been a dumb dog time or two. <laughs> I mean, I didn't learn my lesson the first time, and off I went, and that rope grabbed me, and I flipped me, and the good Lord said, now, son, you all right? Here, let me brush you off a little bit there. Here, come on home for a while. <laughs> and uh, then we have fellowship again. Then for too long, uh, the old nature, the old man, you know. He, how many of you know the old man's not dead? Raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. All right. First thing you know, he starts talking to you, and you get to thinking, you know, and here you go. Taking off again. Same rope grabs you, buddy, and flips you, and finally you get up and dust yourself off. Good night. And you've learned something. You've learned something. You know what the Bible says about the dog returning to his vomit, sow that is washed to her wallowing in the mire? That's what the wicked man, the unsaved, do because they have no chastening. They go right back to it, 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 right back to it. Right? But if you've been born again, you'll raise your head up in the pig trough, eating husk with a swine, and you'll say, hold on a minute. How did I ever get here? Wait a minute. This is not my home. I don't belong here. This is what I used to be. I'm going home. I don't think he had any trouble finding home. And his daddy saw him coming a long way off. I like to think daddy went out every day to the top of the hill. And he looked way off in the distance. Maybe my son will come home today. Every day he'd go out there. I don't think the elder brother went out there with his daddy. He was out and didn't care about it, but Daddy did. And boy, when he saw him coming at a distance, Daddy started jumping up and down and shouting, Hallelujah to God. If I could just get folks to understand, I know you've slipped off into something. You're probably doing something now you thought you'd never would do again. You, you, you're in a mess. Something's happening to you. And you're thinking, well, I've done this, and God's already forgiven me for it before. He'll never forgive me for it again. There's just, just, I just, I, I'm just an absolute failure. I'm a, I'm, a def, I'm a defeatist. That's it. I can't. That's the devil. Come back. Come back to him. <laughs> Come back. Come back. We used to sing a song. I don't know if it's in that book or not, but I remember when I first got saved, they used to sing it. The same road that took you away will lead you home again. You ever heard that one? Something like that. I don't remember the words exactly. Same road will bring you back to the Father. The Father loves you, folks. The Father loves you. The Bible said Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He did. The Bible said Moses found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Not in the exact terminology, but Moses found grace. And ask yourself this question now. 
if Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, was it because Noah, God knew Noah could build that ship? Or was it because Noah was uh, a son of Seth? Or was it because Noah was a preacher of righteousness? That's what the Bible calls him in the New Testament, a preacher of righteousness. Why did Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Only the Lord can answer that question. But I know one thing. When he makes a choice, he never makes a mistake. <laughs> never. And I'm here tonight because he made a choice and convicted me. And then I called on his holy name. I owe him for everything, folks. I do. I owe him for everything. If I ever amount to a hill of beans in this world, it'll only be by the grace of God. Father, I pray that you'd bless your word and the study of it tonight. And bless my brothers and sisters as we've come together before you. You know the battles we fight, Father. You know the enemy. You know how, what we have to deal with. You know my battles. You know their battles. You know every individual's battles. And Father, tonight I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed and I persuaded. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. That world before the